Hey guys, welcome to this session on chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. My name is Sam Willis and I'm the senior lecturer for the Australian Paramedical College. Now COPD, in my opinion, is a very difficult condition to manage from a pre-hospital perspective. The reason being is that COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, is a disease that is characterized by permanent destructive changes within the airways. And what this means is that the, the interventions that you provide as a paramedic are really only supplementary to make the patient more comfortable because the, 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 the damage has already been done to the lungs and there's nothing that you can do as the paramedic that's actually gonna do anything long-term. So of course, your role is to make the patient comfortable, try to maintain their oxygenation, and of course, give them the most, the, the most professional service that you can give them. So the purpose of this session is to discuss COPD in the context of the three diseases that make it up. So in other words, what are the three diseases? How are they characterized within the body? Um, and of course, look at the signs and symptoms associated with COPD. But rather than bombard you with massive lists of all the different signs and symptoms, I've pulled out the key signs and symptoms that can help you to manage this if you were to be presented with this in the real world or even in the simulated world. And then we're going to talk about the most appropriate um, pre-hospital treatment of COPD, as well as how you can adapt your history taking for patients who present with COPD. So I'd like to use a case study to try and exemplify um, this case. Now, you're sent to a private address for a male who is complaining of a chest infection. When you arrive, you are met by an elderly male sitting in his favorite chair. So he hasn't moved much, but the door is open and you're able to go in. You notice he has home oxygen. So you see that sitting next to his chair and he has the nasal cannula in his nose. So it's like a transparent, translucent tube that goes around his ears and into, into his nose. He appears to have blue lips and cannot complete a sentence in one breath, but he is conscious, he is alert, and he is looking at you as you come into the, into the house. As you say ambulance, he's short of breath like this. Very short of breath, can't breathe. Now, let's just stop there and have a think about what's occurred here. First of all, you've been dispatched to a private address. So that's the first thing, working out whether this is a private address, it's in the public. So you, you go to a private address. So there's all sorts of things that you can, um, that's in your favor here. So you'll be able to have an environment that has, has got some things in the environment to help you to determine what's happened. And as you've walked in, you've seen the oxygen straight away. So immediately you, you are thinking that this person has got a prescription from a medical practitioner of oxygen because you can't just go into a chemist and buy oxygen. So that's just one example of how the environment has helped you to make a decision. You've also seen that this person is an elderly male. COPD does predominantly affect the, the, the middle age to the, to the elderly populations, with one definition of elderly being around 64, 65 years of age. Um, there are different definitions of that. Um, remembering that COPD is a disease predominantly caused by cigarette smoking. So the person must have had a lifetime of cigarette smoking um, to, to actually be suffering from one of the conditions of COPD. So immediately there's a lot in the, in the history and the environment straight away. One of the things that we've got on here is you see a male with an oxygen canister, you see the nasal cannula, you see that he's pale, he is looking at you. This is what we call the patient assessment triangle. There's three parts of the patient assessment triangle and that's looking at the circulation to the skin. So on this occasion, he is pale. The work of breathing, <sighs> quite labored, and difficult and can't complete a sentence in one breath, and the general appearance. So in other words, when you walk into the address, he does look at you and he is relatively alert. So that suggests that he's been in this situation for quite some time, because for most of us, if we have acute shortness of breath, we tend to lose all situational awareness. Okay, so COPD then. So COPD is a triad of diseases caused predominantly by cigarette smoking, but can also be caused by some industrial environments such as coal mining or any environment when you're, where you're trapped with certain chemicals. Now, today's standards are quite strict. Today, employment standards are quite strict and 
you know, work health and safety does everything it can to try and prevent industrial lung diseases. But the, the evidence still shows that it's cigarette smoking that causes reversible, um, it, 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 permanent destructive changes, changes and irreversible changes to the airways. And we're gonna take a look at those in a moment. They're characterized by permanent, permanent being the key word here, because if you've got a permanent destruction, it's impossible for you to do anything more than just make the patient comfortable. And sometimes you can't even do that. And in my own experiences, you will go to patients in the continuum of COPD. So for example, at one end of the extremes, you will have the patient who is basically in end stages of respiratory failure, and they are basically going to die that night. And I, I use that term die quite loosely. You do have to be, use your words um, quite directly when you're, when you're talking about um, certain medical conditions. Um, and on one occasion, I was called to a, uh, an elderly patient. It was the middle of the night, two, three, four o'clock in the morning. And we were called by the, the relative, it was the daughter that we were called by. We went upstairs and we had this particular case of an, an elderly female who was, <sighs> she wasn't ventilating. <sighs> the daughter was distraught. She was very upset by the fact that her mother couldn't breathe, as she would be. So when we arrived on scene, she was short of breath. She couldn't breathe. Her, her GCS was about 13, so she wasn't fully alert. She was pale and sweaty. She wasn't ventilating. So we got her into the back of the ambulance. We ventilated for her using a um, bag valve mask. So we put the mask on her face and ventilated for her. By today's standards, ambulance services do have CPAP, continuous, continuous positive airway pressure, where they use an oxygen-driven device to actually force the, the oxygen into the patient's airway. And that really does make the patient more comfortable. But we were doing a manual version of that. We pre-alerted the hospital told them we were coming in with this lady who was not ventilating effectively. When we arrived, all the medical team were there. They greeted the ambulance and we took them into the resuscitation room. We then went and booked into the, into the, into the hospital. So we, we went to the administrative side and informed the hospital that we were there so that they could create a, a note, create notes. By the time we came back, all the medical team had gone back um, or gone back to what they were originally doing before we had taken them away because that's what happens with a pre-alert. They stop doing what they're doing and they come and deal with the more serious cases. And that's the process of triage. It's very effective. When I spoke to the, uh, the relative, I said, what's happening? A minute ago, there were three, four doctors and nurses and now there's nobody. What's happening? And she said, look, it's end stages of respiratory failure and they can't do anything for her. Um, they don't give her, they, they don't think she's going to make it through the night. So as you can imagine, Going through that as the relative is extremely distressful. But I can assure you, even being in the back of the ambulance with somebody who is short of breath, you know he's, who is going to die, who is in a lot of discomfort, it does take its toll on the family and the paramedics as well. And particularly considering that this disease is reversible and prevent, not reversible, but preventable by not smoking in the first instance. Again, it can have its toll on you as a clinician, as well as on the family members and those around you. So between 2014 and 2015, there were reported 460,000 and 400 people living with COPD in Australia. So that was three years ago now. So of course, uh, we don't know whether the numbers have gone up or down. You'd have to look at the, the rates of cigarette smoking in Australia. Paramedics will routinely be called to COPD patients who are unable to manage their symptoms. Now on most occasions, Patients will be able to, they will do their best to live a quality of life and undertake normal activities of daily living. In other words, getting up in the morning, trying to work, trying to do their normal duties. Occasionally, they will become short of, short of breath and then they will use the home oxygen. Generally speaking, they do not take the home oxygen all the time because it can become addictive and it can be harmful. And, on, and in, in addition to that, um, it actually becomes less effective if you're using it all the time. So what that means for you as the paramedic is, when you arrive on scene and see somebody with shortness of breath using their oxygen, the patient is not in a good way. Okay, so the COPD triad then. So we use these terms, chronic bronchitis. Chronic means long-term. Bronchitis, any word that ends in itis is an inflammation of, and bronch, it means bronchioles or bronchi, so that's the lower part of the airways in the lungs. Emphysemia is emphysema is um, a permanently rounded 
alveoli. In other words, in your lungs, you've got these small pockets called alveoli, which allow the oxygenation and gaseous exchange to occur. But with emphysema, they, you have one huge round uh, pocket, which does not help gaseous exchange at all. And then a chronic asthma means long-term asthma, again, where you have scarring of the airways because of the, the way that it's manifested over the years, which again, um, affects oxygenation, as well as having acute buildup of uh, mucus. So let's take a look at those in, in the form of an image. Chronic bronchitis. So on this image here, there's a normal bronchial tube. So here's your bronchi here. And here's the bronchiole of uh, somebody with bronchitis. Now, difficult to see on this image, but it is inflamed, remembering that the, the word itis is inflammation. But the biggest thing that you can see here is that it's got mucus production. And to be honest, it's very similar to chronic asthma, except with chronic asthma, you're getting scar tissue as well, which again, doesn't help oxygenation. Typical signs and symptoms of chronic bronchitis include productive cough. Productive means you're coughing up all this mucus here. So when your patient coughs, there's a lot of bringing the mucus up in the throat and expectorating it. That just means coughing it out or swallowing it. Not pleasant at all. Shortness of breath or dyspnea, difficulty in breathing because there's a lack um, of space here for oxygen to occur to get down. Chest discomfort because of that lack of oxygen. Fatigue because it's hard work. Um, fatigue just means tiredness. And these people are described as blue bloaters. Now, it's, first it seems like um, an offensive term. Now, historically, it's something that has been used, but they're still using it in the medical um, language. Now, imagine if there's no oxygen getting to your lungs, then you are going to look a little bit blue. And that's where this term comes from. And of course, bloater means that it's the shape of the patient. So there's a shape change as well. But this is chronic bronchitis, and this is one of the three conditions that makes up COPD. Now, emphysema. Here you can see the normal alveoli. These are the pockets that I was referring to, small round pockets, small round tubes that allow air to go in and to, be, um, to oxygenate the blood because you can see the, the capillary beds just here on the alveoli. These are the terminal ends of the respiratory system. In other words, the distal end, the right at the very end of the respiratory system. And they connect directly with the um, capillary beds, which then takes the oxygen, um, oxygenated blood, takes it around the system and gives CO2 back to the oxygenated, to the blood and excretes it. However, as you can see here, instead of having small alveoli, small pockets, you've got one huge pocket and that affects gaseous exchange. And again, signs and symptoms, chronic coughing, shortness of breath, blue tinged lips, described as a pink puffer, because these people are not hypoxic, but instead there's a, a pink tinge to their, to their face, which is a CO2 buildup. So there's a, um, a, a direct change in color from blue to pink, and that's emphysema. Now, as you can see on this one here, Chronic asthma, you can see uh, the airway of a mild asthma patient, so you can see that there's some um, inflammation, constriction, and there's also some mucus here. This circle here should be nice and wound, round and clear. Chronic asthma with airway remodeling. So this is what we're looking at with chronic asthma, which is why it gets COPD. Notice how you've got, you've got increased mucus production, the muscle has gone thicker. Look at the compare the muscle, muscle wall here. It's much thicker, which all contributes to reducing air. Increased inflammatory cells, so you've got inflammation. And increased fibrosis, which is damaged tissue as well. And it's, and it's um, reduced elasticity as a result of that. Experience your wheeze, so when these patients are breathing out, you can hear the wheeze. Difficulty in breathing, chest discomfort. Now, the good news is, if you notice how a lot of these signs and symptoms are the same, if your patient says, oh, I've got asthma, chronic asthma or um, emphysema or bronchitis, chronic bronchitis, remembering that people can have acute bronchitis uh, where it comes and goes with the seasonal changes, then you can just treat all of those the same way with salbutamol, ipratropium bromide, 
and, and oxygen as well. Those are the three key drugs. But again, you've got to really follow uh, the guidelines laid out for you by your ambulance service. Now let's talk a little bit about history taking because you've got to, you've got to make your history um, as close as possible to the disease that you're, that you're inquiring about. So once you've made your patient comfortable and you've established that it's COPD, you've had a listen to the chest, you've done some physical history taking, you've made your patient comfortable with as many drugs as possible, you've sat them upright, ask them questions such as, when were you diagnosed with COPD? What was the underlying cause? Because it might not always be cigarette smoking, but on most occasions it is. And this one here, most occasions your patients are still smoking. Now, that's not for you really to judge. Remembering you're going in there and, and providing non-biased, you know, non-prejudiced care for these patients. Uh, the only difference to that is if you arrive in the address and they're still smoking, now that's actually harmful for you. So you're within your legal and ethical rights to say, look, can you just put the cigarette out, please, just while we are here? Um, what was the underlying cause? Has your COPD worsened? In other words, what's going on? Why, if it hasn't worsened, why are we here today? Has there been something that's irritated it? And when you start to read in the text, there are a range of different things that irritate COPD, including unexpected exercise, chest infections, and comorbidity, other, other illnesses. How do you currently treat it? Now, some people will say, oh, I'm on oxygen three or four times a day. Others will say, I only take oxygen once every few days when I get short of breath. So that gives you an idea as to how serious it is. And this is the type of information you need to be providing to the hospital staff. How frequently do you get your exacerbations? How do you manage those exacerbations? Well, when I have it, I usually get the oxygen, sit down, allow my body to recover. Other past medical history of medications, just remembering that COPD is only one illness and patients do tend to have comorbidities. And of course, you can inquire about whether it runs in the family, um, as well as this one here, do you, you know, what's your lifestyle like? Are you still living your life? Or are you struggling to live the activities of daily living? Do you manage to get to the toilet okay? Do you need home care? Do you need social services to come in and help you with those things? Because those are really, really important things. So the treatment focuses around identify, maintain, and keep and transfer. Identify the cause of the trigger and provide treatment where possible. As I've said to you, COPD is permanently, um, it's permanently there. So really, your, your, your management really is around helping with shortness of breath. And that includes maintaining the oxygen levels between 88 and 92%. So when it comes to choosing the right oxygen mask, with the patient in this case study, imagine that you've arrived on scene and you've put an oxygen saturation probe on their finger. And it says that they've got saturations of 80% or 85%. Now, you're going to still have to get those oxygen levels up to between 88 and 92. So it's obvious that their own home oxygen is not working. You may start by turning their oxygen up, or you might replace their oxygen nasal tubing with your own oxygen tubing and turn it up. Or you may change the mask and use a medium concentration mask or a high flow concentration mask. Whatever happens with an oxygen saturation of 80% that you're struggling to maintain between 80 and 92, uh, you can't leave them at home. You're going to have to take them to hospital for ventilatory support and or a further assessment and treatment. We've also said that there are some drugs that you can use depending on your guidelines, and that includes salbutamol and ipratropium bromide or Atrovent. These are the two main drugs that you'll be using. Keeping the patient relaxed and calm means that they're not going to be stressed or fatigued or it's going to minimize stress and fatigue. The last thing you, that patient needs is you um, panicking because it can be difficult for the, for the paramedic, particularly when you're new, to try not to be stressed when you see that patient. And then, of course, transferring the patient to hospital in an upright position, uh, making the patient as comfortable as possible is really, really important. And, of course, monitoring throughout all of the journey, monitoring the A's, the B's, the C's, conti continuously throughout, doing your history taking, um, and of course, doing everything you can to make the patient comfortable. So that's an insight into COPD. Um, when you start to look at COPD from an intensive care viewpoint and start looking at uh, acid-base balances and gases, the whole subject becomes so much more interesting, uh, but that's really for another session. Now, when you arrive at the workshops, the face-to-face -face workshops, you will be shown how to use the oxygen masks you will be taught a little bit more about COPD 
and you will be shown how to use the nasal cannula um, as well as how to use the nebulizer masks. In this session, we've recognized the diseases that make up COPD, identifying the key signs and symptoms, and recognizing the most appropriate pre-hospital treatment of COPD. Thanks, guys.